So, yeah, I, uh, I have this talk, but I, I just wanted to thank you firstly, because I have the opportunity to be with you in Pittsburgh and then a little bit in Stanford. And it was a very great time. And uh, I'm the, the, the little guy at the upper right corner. And uh, <laughs> it's so fun to see me in, a, in, the, in this picture. But thank you very much because I can feel the, the kindness and uh, I, I'm very honored and very pleased to, to be a part of this great family of anatomy. And I, I keep working and I'm very honored to speak uh, of my work and try to, uh, to give the, the, the enthusiasm of working about anatomy, of learning more and more about neurosurgical anatomy and, and try to apply it uh, to the OR, right? That the, the philosophy of uh, all of us today. So just a little, little bit talk about uh, cranial nerve tracking and the interest of, of this tractography uh, for pre-surgical planning, uh, of particularly of, for, for skull-based tumor surgery. And uh, I just wanted to talk to you today about my PhD project. And it, well, it was all about cranial nerve tracking. And uh, I wanted to present the different step of uh, the, the PhD project, if you don't mind. So skull-based tumor, uh, that's not a, a new challenge. That's very, a very old challenge. And as you can see in this picture of uh, Andreas Vesalius, it was in 1543. And he drew this like, uh, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> like a huge, huge skull-based tumor. And uh, he, uh, all, he, at this time, he, he, he was already a challenge. So skull base is a challenge. It's an anatomical challenge because of the rich anatomical environment, a lot of vessels, a lot of cranial nerve, as you know, and it put at risk the surgery. So we have classical uh, imaging, but as you can see in, the, in this picture, the classical MRI can't uh, divide the cranial nerves and their pos position in the context of complex skull based tumor. As you can see, uh, Maybe I put my, yeah, my pointer. And you can see on the, on the right side, the, the acoustic fascial bundle is well seen in the, in the normal condition, in healthy conditions. But when you have a tumor, you, you can't see the, the, the cranial nerves. Uh, they are you know, displaced, uh, flattened around the tumor. And in all the case of like a epidermal cyst, you, you can't see the tumor. You, you have a lot of, you know, changes uh, due to the tumor growing and that's very very hard and uh, when you love anatomy uh, when you are involved in anatomy you want to do a, a very a a thorough preoperative planning and you want to anticipate the position of cranial nerve so that that's the point and we you we can't do this actually so advances in imaging have brought a new tool that is tractography and what is that it's just a, a tool uh, from the diffusion MRI and it, it can, uh, the tractography is a pipeline, is a process uh, from the diffusion MRI because the, the diffusion MRI can detect movement of water molecule along fibers in the biological tissues. And then if you apply a mathematical algorithm, you can reconstruct step-by-step step the trajectory of fibers. That's the, the general principle. And uh, for, if you want to do that, you need to put a region of interest within a working space, and then you apply the algorithm. And the algorithm can be either deterministic or probabilistic. Deterministic, it, it gives you a trajectory of fibers because you will find uh, voxel to voxel uh, the, the, the most similar orientation of the water molecule along fibers. And probabilistic, you would just apply the algorithm and search the most probable trajectory of fibers. That's two different uh, way to do that. But the problem of tractography is the resolution, either spatial and angular. Spatial resolution, because of the diffusion MRI, most of the time the, the sequence, uh, the voxel, uh, two millimeter, uh, the size of two millimeters and the angular resolution is, is slow. And the, most of the time you can detect um, the, the crossing fibers. That means in some area of the brain, especially 
in the brain stem, as uh, Max previously uh, shown, that a lot of uh, fibers crossing in different direction. And with classical diffusion MRI, you, you can detect uh, these different population of uh, fibers within uh, a same area. So there are diffu different diffusion model. Uh, as you know, the, the tractography was developed at the very beginning of the 2000. Uh, and then uh, most advanced diffusion model were developed. Uh, for example, the orientation distribution function, which is a mathematical model that can depict, can describe uh, the, the, the orientation of water molecule within a voxel, but it can describe different population of uh, fibers in a very narrow space, uh, contrary to the DTI model. So different diffusion model, and when we apply it in a complex crossing fibers areas uh, with the ODF, which is a new model, diffusion model, you, you can have a more precise or more close to the reality uh, result. So if you think about tractography or fiber tracking, you realize that is not a, a unique uh, process. It's, it's a pipeline, it's a multi-steps pipeline from the diffusion MRI acquisition to the final rendering. It's very complex. And you have to understand and master all uh, each of the step of the pipeline. So when we start to to, to this study about cranial nerve tractography, we just uh, look at the scientific literature. We, we found 21 studies of, about cranial nerve tracking, but there was a great variability, a lot of different MRI acquisition settings, a lot of different MRI machine, a lot of different tracking settings, a lot of different software, and finally, a lot of different rendering. So it was hard to, to know what would be the best for a study about unit about chronic of tracking. So we we try to put together all the studies and find the best combination of settings for uh, chronic nerve tractography. And then we think about how to do that in the best way and we change a little bit the, the strategy of raw design, a way of the, the drawing of the region of interest. And we use the ODF map superimposed on the T2 map to have the best trade-off uh, between the, uh, the anatomy, the anatomical control, which is the T2 and the diffusion working space, which in the ODF map. And we draw a region of interest in three dimension, and then we apply the algorithm. That's a right, different, uh, uh, a new way of thinking about the draw of the, the raw design. Then we start the clinical studies and we, uh, it was very fun because it, it was our patient and, and we, we have the, the authorization by the local ethical committee to, to just add a one or two sequence for the classical preoperative MRI and just try to work and try to find the, the best uh, um, the best way to do cranial nerve tracking. And uh, we, uh, we have this, uh, this 62 patient and we were able to track the cranial nerves on the healthy side for all, all cranial nerves were tracked. But on the tumor side, we choose to focus on only those uh, that were displaced by tumors. And for those cranial nerves displaced, we were able to track uh, most of them, 87%. And we were able to control the reality of the tracking in uh, 93%. That was a good, good result. But the most important result of this first clinical study, what we, we realized that if we think about how the tractography uh, would help us for surgical management of our complex skull-based tumors, uh, it helps us for the in, in uh, 71 person, either for surgical decision, should we operate or not? Because of we, the, the tractography help us to define the surgical risk. And uh, it helped us to, to, to choose the surgical approach. So should you use uh, 
this anterior, this lateral, posterior uh, approach. And, uh, and at the end, uh, it, it helps us a lot for the different uh, surgical step. I want to illustrate my, my, my purpose, my talk with uh, some cases. And uh, we have this classical vestibular schwannoma, uh, not so huge, but it was very hard to find the, the position of the facial nerve. That is usually the case. But in this case, we were able to track and to differentiate, to distinguish the, the facial nerve and the, and the cochlear uh, nerve. And we had this uh, anterior position of the facial nerves, and we, we, we were able to move fast at the beginning of the dissection to debulk uh, quickly the tumor and then carefully dissect the, the, the facial nerve. So it was a, a good help for the preoperative pl planning and also for lead surgery and the different uh, step of the removal. Another case would be this petroclival meningioma or the upper uh, clival meningioma. Uh, we, uh, we, we were able to, to describe the position of the oculomotor nerve, which, were, which was uh, displaced superiorly. And uh, then we were able to, uh, to, to see the, the position of the trigeminal and abdescence nerve. And then we choose a subtemporal septum approach uh, that allows us to spare the, the fourth, uh, five and six cranial nerves. So it was very uh, useful to anticipate the surgical uh, the traps and then to adjust and to tailor the surgical approach uh, for this tumor. Another illustrative case is uh, this giant epidermal cyst with supra-infratentral extension. And if you look at the classical uh, MRI, you can't very, uh, uh, you, you can see the position of the cranial nerve you are not sure this one is the third, you, you can do that. Maybe this one is the fifth, but the, the, the tractography uh, uh, showed us that this one is, was really the third nerve and it was more uh, easy to, to see the, the position of the cranial nerve within the, the cyst. And then we were able to do the, the surgery with more confidence because before doing the surgery, uh, we we knew the position of uh, most of the cranial nerves. Um, we had this other case, which is not, which was not we did, didn't belong to the study, but it was very interesting. At the beginning of our cranial nerve uh, study, uh, we had this uh, young lady who was hit by a bus, and she she wake up uh, with a, a very st strange uh, clinic symptoms. She had an isolated left oculomotor palsy. And when you look at the classical MRI, you can see like uh, actional uh, diffuse lesions, but the brainstem was uh, completely free of uh, ischemic or traumatic uh, lesions. So we were not able to explain uh, this uh, isolated left oculomotor palsy. And then we, we decided to, to test if the tractography can help us in this uh, case. And as you can see on the, on the left, on the right uh, picture, when you apply the tracking on both uh, third cranial nerve, you can see on the right side, the trajectory of, of the nerve, but on the left side, there was a sharp arrest of the third cranial nerve just before entering the cavernous sinus. So it was unfortunately a, a cut or like a, yeah, a, a cut be, uh, because of the TBI. So another case was this very large uh, arachnoid cyst and uh, we test uh, the tractography of cranial nerve. So when we try to put the in 3D, the position of cranial nerve, it draw us the window or the working space we will have, we would have in surgery. So we had like the, the same uh, window, like with the acoustic fascial bundle pushed superiorly and the lower nerve, the ninth and the rootlets of the, the tenth nerve uh, pushed inferiorly. And we, we could uh, anticipate the window, the working space or the surgical corridor we would have in surgery using this tractography. That, were, that was very useful. And uh, the, this, uh, this technique was not perfect. And we had difficulty because of cranial nerve 
And as you can imagine, the corneal nerves are not uh, anatomically uh, preserved in case of complex tumor. And uh, most of the time, I use the picture of kanji wrapping because the, the wrap, the, the membranes of the, the tumor, most of the time, the cranial nerves are flattened exactly like the membranes of the tumor. So the, the, the anatomy of the nerve is, is completely different. So it's, it, it makes the tracking very, very hard. And uh, the, the tumor could, could uh, be another trap because of the diffusion signal is very similar to the nerve. Imagine a vestibular schwannula, which is a tumor of the, um, uh, of the membrane exactly of the nerve. So the diffusion signal is the same than the cranial nerve. So that makes the tracking very difficult. The proximity, the, the close relationships with brain stimuli also another trap because, because a lot of uh, tracks within the brain stimuli can uh, disturb uh, the tracking of tiny fibers of cranial nerve. So there are a lot of you know, problems you need to solve distortion um, up at the skull base, which are very huge uh, because of the close interface between uh, brain, hair, uh, water, etc. Uh, you also need a ground truth control. You can track anything, but you need to control what you, what, what you are doing. So that's another, um, another trap. And uh, you have to find a good the, the best trade-off between the machine time, you, can put the, you can't put the patient during hours in the MRI machine to get some beautiful images. You need to have a trade-off between MRI machine time, post-treatment time, etc. And then if you want to do that, you need skills in anatomy, yeah, for sure, but also in uh, MRI and computer science to do all the steps of the pipeline. So, when I uh, was in the middle of this study, I just uh, continued my, my, you know, searching in the scientific literature, and uh, there they had this paper of uh, Juan's team and about chronic nerve tracking in healthy conditions, and uh, I, I thought, okay, I, I need to be there. So uh, I, I asked Juan, and uh, he was uh, very fastly okay to to for me to be there. So I. Thanks, thanks a lot, Juan, because it was very, very good to, to, go, to go to Pittsburgh to and move forward with, with this 2D. And then we changed our mind and we decided to use uh, the software of tracking uh, designed in Pittsburgh by Frankier, which is DSI Studio, and we, we changed our mind, changed our strategy to do the, uh, the chronic of tracking. We used like a, a, a unique region of interest that include all the brain stem, all the cerebellum, all the cranial nerve skull base systems. And uh, we apply like a, a deterministic algorithm to, to do a full track to full tractography. And uh, we have this result, like a reconstruction of the wool, wool working space with the cerebellum, brain stem and cranial nerve. It was very, very nice, but this one was like a, a healthy, healthy uh, patient. So we have very promising results. So we decided to move forward and try to use this technique for our clinical cases. And uh, yeah, if you zoom, you can see quite good details of the, uh, the anatomy using MRI diffusion tracking. So that's promising, very promising. You, you can see the anterior pedicular fossa, the cerebral, cerebral pointing angle. And uh, then we, we try to, to move forward. So, I wanted to show you uh, this video about how we did this. So just, I will put my, uh, okay. Can you see the screen or not? Okay, just, I, I just to share uh, this we cannot, one. We cannot see. Okay, okay, I will. I have I will to change. change the screen you're sharing. Exactly. Okay, I will. So close um, this one and open the new one. Uh -huh. Okay, this way, it could be better. Is, is it better? You got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, this one uh, is, is like a huge vestibular schwannoma and uh, we try to, to apply this one, like a unique, huge region of interest and we neg negated uh, it 
uh, to have uh, a greater region of avoidance, to remove uh, all, all of the, the, the things outside the region of interest to working space. And then we applied a full uh, brand steam uh, tractography. We did a cl little cleanup, but at the end, the result is quite good. You have the anatomy and the tumor within its full uh, anatomical environment. You can see the third nerve, the three terminal nerve, six nerve, the lower, the acoustic fascial bundle. And that's fun because using this technique, if you, you can move around and you can see in a 3D and you can anticipate uh, the position of cranial nerve and it helps a lot to create your own mental map as a neurosurgeon. You have, thanks to this tool, uh, a very uh, a very useful mental map of the position of the vessel or cranial nerves around the tumor. And if you look at very carefully, maybe you can see the facial nerve and the uh, cochlear nerve, which uh, seems to be separated. And uh, you have the feeling that the facial nerve will be very anterior to the tumor. So that's that's a good uh, good tool we we had. So I will share more my presentation yes so i continue yeah and uh we had another example at the a p2 clavicle management on the, on the left side and we tried to um, to apply it with the same case i presented just before and then we applied the, the this full track tractography uh, a pipeline on, on these cases and and we have the the same perspective we had the third nerve uh, going superiorly, and we can uh, anticipate the position of cranial nerve all around the, the tumor in the, in the anatomical environment. And we can turn around the brain steam and see the difference, uh, uh, potential uh, surgical approach. And using this, uh, we, uh, we confirm the, the best uh, uh, surgical corridor we can use for access to the tumor using this tool. Yeah, now the, yeah, that's the same case, large vestibular schanoma. And the, the, the most uh, important uh, um, help is to create a 3D mental map for, this, for the surgeon, right? And then we, we, we thought about the, the, the fact that we had uh, optimized the MRI setting. So we need to, do, to, to know if the pipeline of full track can, can be applied in any uh, uh, data set of MRI. So we put one patient of the human connectome project very randomly, and we, we put this, uh, we apply, we apply the, the pipeline to this patient, and the result is quite uh, interest, uh, interesting because we have a very clean uh, uh, constriction of the brain stem, cerebellum, or some cranial nerves, but as you can, you can see the mesencephalum is not good and the cranial nerves are cut very shortly uh, in the systemal uh, trajectory. So that's good, not perfect, but the, the pipeline is not, not so bad. And uh, once again, we have uh, uh, some difficult uh, using this, uh, uh, this technique and uh, there are a lot of traps to be solved and we are still working on it as you can, uh, as you can imagine. And the best, uh, the, the, best, the best point for me is to try to apply this technique or make this tractography uh, applicable in the clinical practice, in the routine practice of all of us. And uh, that's why I, I'm keep working, but we have a lot of, of problems. We face a lot of problems, um, especially the, the difference between the the machine, MRI machine, with a lot of different parameters. So I try to, to work on this. And, and also another point, it's what, what would be the perspective of using this uh, promising tool in the, in the clinical practice? We can uh, try to reduce the spatial resolution uh, thanks to upsampling. Upsampling is, a, is a, an other tool uh, within the, the software DSI studio. You, you can put, you can start from a, um, two millimeters voxel and you can try to, to get some 1.5 millimeter voxel with a very, very uh, increased uh, spatial resolution. So that could be a, a good uh, perspective. Another one would be try to move forward in the 
automatization of the of the of the process try to remove the uh, operator dependent step uh, and the uh, the clustering and machine learning would be another perspective because it can uh, detect the the similar orientation of odf uh, remember the the diffusion model and uh, it can uh, automatically reconstruct some kernel nerve if you uh, if you train the machine to do that. So it could be a, a very good perspective. Another one is if you uh, look at uh, very regularly some uh, ODF map and various uh, tumor, uh, skull-based tumors, you will have the, the feeling that in most of case, uh, the ODF signal which has, we will have a, a pattern, a recurrent pattern if you look at uh, this uh, ODF, when uh, in, in this case of huge uh, CPA meningioma, you will have the feeling that the ODF signal will, will have a very centripet pattern. Uh, in case of schwannoma, the ODF will be like uh, turning around the tumor, turning within the tumor. And in case of epidemic cyst, the ODF signal will be like completely chaotic. So, that could be a, a promising perspective because uh, if you look at the ODF map, you, you can have like a, an histological uh, uh, diagnosis before doing the surgery. So it could be a, a help. Uh, of course, there are a lot of older perspective uh, uh, like a spinal cord um, tractography. So I, I don't have to, to do a lot about that, but I just wanted to thank you very much listening to me today and i'm very very honored to be a part of this meeting and thanks juan uh, thanks to all of the attendees all of the faculty for beautiful dissection and uh yeah i, I wish you a, a very nice day and hope you uh, we will learn more about anatomy the next uh, presentation thank you very much thanks team beautiful presentation um it is really is impressive. Some of your reconstructions are very impressive. Uh, uh, I don't know if anyone will make a comment, anybody, but it, it is really is impressive the ability to see the cranial nerves in a, in a vestibular schwannoma, for example. So uh, I do have one comment and a, and a question. So the software you're using, uh, I, I would recommend anybody with interest to use it because it's a great software for surgical planning. I've used it for many years when I'm doing brain tumors. Um, and um, for the fibers in, inside the brain, you know, you can uh, do this modeling and you can actually even see it in 3D. You can do surgical planning. You have a, your own surgical planning station and it's free. You know, it's a free software. And, and so it's very useful for planning, but it is time consuming. So what I want to ask you, uh, Tim, is how long does it take to um, clean up, to dissect digitally, as we say, because it's like doing white matter dissection, but in a computer. How long does it take mm -hmm. to get to the to your final product that you are satisfied with? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. <laughs> this software is very useful, and I have thanks to you the opportunity to work in the office just close to the developer of the software. So frankly, it was just close to me during my my stay in Pittsburgh. So it was easy for me to to learn more about the the software because I had the opportunity to ask a lot of questions for Frank and to to solve a lot of problems. So. Yeah, you you are completely right. So it takes time to be confident, uh, comfortable with the use of surgery, but it's it's doable. Every every body we we want to evolve in it can can do it. So for me, if I uh, we we learn uh, to to the applying in clinical practice, so we want to the the this technique is uh, is usable for everyone. So we try to reduce the time we spend on the software. So at the end, when I apply the full tractography, I just need 50 minutes just to clean a little bit with the mouse. I remove all the strong or false continuations. So I need uh, at the end 30 minutes from the beginning to the end. It's like 50 minutes to you know, do the step of the tracking and then 50 minutes to clean. That's wonderful because that's usually the same time it would take me when I when I, I bring more case maybe less because it's it's easier to see the you know the yeah. bigger fiber tracks but and and that's why it's also 
you know, often be asked by other surgeons, so let's do fiber tracking. I want to see it. So if they think that you do fiber tracking and boom, the fiber tracks yeah. are nicely displayed, and there you go. That's your fiber tracking. It's not like that. The good fiber tracking requires time, and it is like doing a dissection in your own case. And when you're used to it, it might take 10, 20 minutes, but if you want to do it better, it takes longer. So it yeah. requires some time work. Anyway. The problem, the problem is, is when we want to do uh, fiber tracking for the brain, you need to separate the different tracts. So that's why we, we change the, the, the approach. You know, okay, we, we don't want to separate, to distinguish every tract. You just uh, want to see the tumor within the anatomical environment. So that was the change of perspective, which help us to do that, like a full tractography. And then after that, with your anatomical experience, you can distinguish the, the different, different corner nerves. But uh, yeah, the, the problem is you need time if you want to separate any